a fantastic panel, and I'll let him introduce them. There are copies of this in the back if you'd like it, but it's available electronically as well. So I hope you enjoy your uh, panel, and I look forward to your feedback. Thank you. It's all to you. Thank you very much, Andrew, and uh, welcome you all. It is a pleasure to organize this panel. I'm Xavier Seu. I'm a senior lecturer at the International Center for Intellectual Property Studies of the University of Strasbourg. Yes. And uh, well, today we have uh, gathered together a fantastic roster of uh, speakers. Uh, they will help us to understand the current trends and challenges uh, when regulating IP and innovation in uh, free trade agreements. All of those uh, present in this room uh, know very well that uh, regional trade agreements uh, have become a major source of intellectual property regulation. Uh, presently, there are more than 400 uh, preferential trade agreements that have been notified to the World Trade Organization. What is uh, striking is that uh, out of these 400, 150 regulate intellectual property in detail. And this has been uh, the trend since the early 2000s. Since the early 2000s up until now, uh, between six and 14 treaties every year regulating, enter, regulating intellectual property enter into force. So we have uh, major negotiations uh, going on, uh, negotiations including the EU with Mexico, with the Mercosur, with India and the like, and uh, this is the confirmation of this trend. So uh, what uh, this panel will try to clarify is this uh, relationship between intellectual property and innovation and whether this framework, the trade framework, is an adequate uh, place to address this relationship. Uh, most important, how to make IP work for development, and what about these most sophisticated uh, trade agreements, including IP chapters? I'm thinking about uh, CETA, but I'm also thinking about complex uh, and difficult negotiations that will take place in the context of this uh, NAFTA 2.0. So there is this contentious interface between intellectual property and investment law as well, so this will also be addressed by the panel. Uh, other aspects that are prominent nowadays, not only in uh, free trade agreement negotiations, but I would say globally in our daily life, mm -hmm. is this uh, relationship between data, data compilation and use. What about free trade agreements? How free trade agreements regulate data? Uh, are we in front of regulatory agreements instead of free trade agreements? This should be the right name, for instance. Uh, well, th there is always this uh, other aspect, you know, the impact of free trade agreements uh, on the local industries, on the local economies. This will be tackled by two representatives of uh, national industry associations. And at the end, we also have now on the table very big players in international trade. Mercosur, India, uh, Indonesia. Is this going to change the content of these free trade agreements or is they are going to stay the same? So, to address this uh, set of issues, we have uh, among us uh, having, I mean, people uh, taking the responsibility for big uh, IP programs. For instance, we have uh, Pedro Duarte, who is the project leader of IPKey. Uh, this is a project of the European Union Intellectual Property Office, uh, and he's based now in uh, Buenos Aires. We also have uh, Professor Patrick Leblon. Uh, he's associate professor at the University of Ottawa, and also associate director of the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. We have Vanessa Lowenstein from the Ministry of Science and Technology, and also a scholar here in Argentina, in the University of Buenos Aires and in Flaxo. We have Provir Meta, a global lead in intellectual property at uh, Facebook. Uh, Mariano Genovesi, who is associate professor at the University of Buenos Aires, but also the head legal counsel of the National Association of Pharmaceutical uh, Producers in Argentina. And we have as well Pranav Kumar, uh, who is head of international trade policy in the Confederation of Indian Industry. So we are, we are going to organize the session in this way. We will have a specific question for each of the panelists. Then we will have, they will answer this question shortly, in about five, six minutes maximum. They will answer afterwards a sort of a more general question and we will open the floor for discussion. So uh, if you allow me to start with speakers, we'll start with Pedro, Pedro Duarte. Uh, Pedro, uh, IP has been uh, usually presented as a tool for innovation 
And uh, in Europe, uh, we have the European Union Intellectual Property Office, and the EWIPO has developed a number of uh, activities. So how do you think that these activities can be used in the region? Can, can we can take advantage of the experience of the EWIPO to uh, make intellectual property work as a tool for development? I think that as this is being broadcast, it's very important to appear in the TV. Yes. Uh, so this is for your audience. Thank and you very much. Uh, thank you, Zever. And I was also requested to do my presentation standing, so I'll have the Fantastic. opportunity to be front center and capture all the attention for myself. No, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for the organization of the symposium. Thank you for SAPI and for you, Zever, for this organization. I would start perhaps by making a small reference of UIPO for those who are not familiar. It's the EU Intellectual Property Office. It's an EU agency uh, in Alicante who has the management of trademarks and designs at the EU level. So uh, or IPRs that are valid for the whole European Union, the 28 member states. Um, since 2013, uh, this agency has accumulated competences in the area of um, observance of IP infringement. So we have an observatory for EU IP infringements, and perhaps I would begin uh, replying to the question in line with the recent work of this observatory based in Alicante. In the last three years, more or less, uh, a trilogy uh, of studies was created. Uh, a narrative that, excuse me for, for being. Oh, it's okay. Uh, a narrative uh, that uh, fosters innovation and gives uh, a political view of why IP should be protected. It started off with uh, IP perception study. So it was made in order to give an analysis of what EU citizens know or believe they know about IP in order to have a good perception of where to have awareness activities and where to start from. The second, perhaps more important study was on the impact of IP on the economy. So along with the European Patent Office, uh, a series of studies have been conducted that allow to determine with specific data, how much do IP <coughs> intensive industries uh, correspond to GDP, growth, employment. For example, uh, this allows us to, in 2016, to ascertain that 25% of employment in the EU comes from EU intensive industry, IP intensive industries. That's over 60 million employments. Uh, for example, in terms of GDP for 2016, that corresponded to almost 40% of the EU uh, GDP, IP intensive industry. So this gives already uh, a positive aspect to how much IP contributes to the economy and always in the perspective of IP being a tool to foster economy, uh, development, innovation. And so the puzzle couldn't be complete without uh, a negative aspect of it, which is how much does infringement cost to the economy? This last study was done with the OECD and uh, reached the final uh, amount of 2.5% of total trade, global trade, is based on infringement of IP rights. That's above 300 billion euros per year. So with this, uh, a narrative was created on the protection of IP, the, the interest, the economic interest in stimulating IP and for the growth of the economy. So now connecting to IP key, the project that brings me here today, the, the EU Commission understands that EU IPO with its technical expertise is best placed to implement these projects in different parts of the world. So IP key Latin America is one of three. There's others in China and Southeast Asia. And it stems from the principle that um, the project should look for the, the creation of a level base, level playing field of IP between the EU and in this case, Latin America. So we stem from this perspective and we have specific goals uh, up until now. We started from September, we are in what we call the inception phase, where we are making consultation to the stakeholders of the region to try to understand what are the different priorities, the different interests, the main concerns of the region in terms of IP, so that then EU IPO can have, within its technical expertise, create a, an activity-based annual work program that is of both common interest and benefits to both uh, EU, and in this case, Latin America. Um, how does this connect to the FTAs? 
one of the objectives of the project, the way it was approved by the commission, was that this team that I'm leading in that has people here in Buenos Aires, in Mexico, and in Lima, gives support to the negotiations, support to the ongoing negotiations, which is the case now in Mercosur, where the IP dialogues have already established uh, FTAs, like it was with the Andean region. And the IP key project is about creating opportunities and activities. So when there are challenges, we have the means, we have the people to foresee for activities, to unver overcome these issues. And replying to the question, how is UIPO uh, in a best place to contribute? We have a long-standing practice of developing IP tools, for example. Uh, throughout the 20 years of existence of UIPO, we were considered the most innovative IP office in the world. And we share these modernization of IP tools with other offices in the EU and now internationally as well. So this is probably the step one, uh, what we saw, what we call quick wins, would be to establish within the IP offices needs for modernization in terms of accessibility, transparency, convergency, uh, predictability of practices. And this would be one of the areas of work. Another would be IT tools for customs. Where another area that is developed uh, in Alicante <coughs> is IT tools for customs to connect between themselves, between themselves and IPR uh, holders to, bar to better uh, react in case of possible infringement of IPRs. And this is another area. Another area would be to promote this type of narrative uh, studies in the region to better habilitate the policymaker, the legislators, to know exactly where they stand, uh, what are the needs and what are the profits of supporting an IP policy. And we are totally flexible in the sense that EUIPO has competences over trademark and designs and the observatory. IP, IP key, however, is uh, with the full competence of IP. So copyrights, GIs, patents. We will be in the region for four years, supporting not only the negotiations of FTAs, but also then the implementation. Probably more importantly, the implementation, because that's when the challenges come and that where IP key has the means to develop activities and their total flexibility, uh, more than tools, uh, databases, platforms, seminars. At this stage, this is the inception phase, the, the project is starting officially in March, so right now we're still uh, studying, creating the teams. I just came to Buenos Aires last month. Uh, but this is to give an idea of how can EUIPO and what we expect from IP, IP key in the next uh, upcoming years. So happy to develop further, but respecting the time that was given, I'll conclude like this. Thank you very much, Pedro. Uh, I think that you have tackled very important oh, issues. Now. The, this uh, empirical assessment of the contribution of IP, uh, the economic studies that can be conducted, uh, well, this is uh, something that uh, all countries negotiating IP agreements put into question sometimes. Well, what I'm going to gain from this, and this is uh, the, the mission of, of uh, IP key to contribute to that knowledge. So we are going to continue with uh, Professor Leblon. Uh, he has been working on the most uh, recent agreements, uh, CETA, NAFTA. Uh, in these agreements, regulatory aspects next to intellectual property are prominent. Um, wh what will you see, uh, Patrick, uh, innovation addressed apart from the IP chapter? Okay. Uh, well, th thank you for the question. Thank you for having me here. Uh, in a way, I'll, I'll bring you a, a Canadian perspective, which I think is, is, is applies to you know many countries developed and you know emerging and developing. Uh, because I interestingly enough, uh, even though Canada has been part of these you know supposedly uh, you know new generation free trade agreements, um, there's actually a debate in Canada right now as to whether. Uh, for instance, the IP chapter in uh, CETA or uh, in, in, in TPP are actually good for Canadian innovation. Uh, currently, uh, in, in Canada, a lot of the intellectual property is actually foreign-owned, uh, and uh, Canadian companies themselves actually generate very little uh, IP in terms of applying for patents, etc. It's mostly foreign-owned companies uh, in Canada that tend to acquire uh, intellectual property rights, uh, and, and it, it's starting to raise a concern, especially in terms of innovation, for instance, where uh, a lot of new firms are actually created, many of them financed uh, by, through government, 
you know, subsidies and other uh, mechanisms, including at the universities. And then what happens is that even though they might apply for the patents, then and, and I'm sure we're seeing this in, in, in other countries, is you know, foreign, foreign firms coming in, especially the larger ones, acquiring the smaller firms, acquiring the, the intellectual property that goes with it, and then, of course, uh, the, the, the value that is attached to that. And then there's a big question as to, well, is it really driving, to what extent is it really driving innovation in Canada? How much of that innovation and that value is, is, is remaining in Canada? So these concerns are actually being raised. And, and, and when people are, have, have looked at the uh, IP chapter, for instance, in CETA and in TPP, of course, uh, Canada has been asked to uh, adapt its uh, intellectual property regime much closer to what uh, the European Union and the U.S. have been doing, whereas Canada before, uh, in a way, was had a much stricter application in terms of you know what the types of patents that could be allowed, uh, um, uh, you know uh, lawsuits in, in in the courts, patent extensions, these kinds of things. Now Canada has been has been pushed. Uh, towards adopting kind of European and, and, and American uh, systems, which a lot of people say, well, that's, you know, for the smaller Canadian firms doing innovation, it's actually working against them. So interestingly enough, it, now that, you know, we've gone that far, we've done the deal with the EU, we, of course, we're part of TPP. Now, if you see actually the TPP 11 or the comprehensive and, and progressive um, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, in fact, the IP, a lot of the IP provisions have actually been lifted. Um, now that the U.S. are not part of there, and it's raising a lot of uh, it's raising a question as to as we are ongoing, you know, our ongoing NAFTA renegotiation, uh, what's going to happen to the IP chapter? Uh, because of course, people expect that it would just be a transposition from the Trans-Pacific Partnership into the NAFTA 2.0. But now the fact that you know, there is kind of a, a stronger pushback from uh, the uh, innovation sector as opposed to the larger business sector, because if you, if you ask the, the, the business associations, they'll say, oh, yes, absolutely, TPP, we need to be there. We need the market access to Japan, to other countries in Asia. Uh, and, and, of course, we need to be part of the game. Otherwise, uh, we're, we're going to lose out, right? In a way, Canada joining TPP later in the game was much more defensive uh, than, than anything, so we kind of took what was there, but now uh, th th there's a lot of questioning as to how far we're going to go, and it's not clear how it's going to affect uh, the negotiations within NAFTA, uh, whether it's Canada, Canada is going to try to push back, maybe with Mexico, and how the Americans, of course, are going to react, and I think this is going to be part of, 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 of the, the negotiations and the compromise that's going to happen, but I think the, ap the IP chapter is probably going to be one of the most contentious ones, which we can expect will be left towards uh, the end <laughs> of the negotiations, if we get there, which is, of course, a big question right now, uh, depending on what Mr. Trump is going to do, whether he decides to pull out. Uh, so I, it, it's kind of interesting where Canada has gone far, and now there's like, oh, well, maybe we've gone too far. And, and, and whether we can pull back, that's a big question, because at the same time, we want to be part of those deals. Canada is, is trade dependent. Uh, we we, we want to be part of, 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 of you know, globalization and, 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 and larger free trade zones uh, in the sense that we believe in open borders for, uh, you know, ideas, goods, services, capital, information, data. Uh, but how do you find that kind of balance between all these things, right? Where you want the free flow of information, you want intellectual property, but at the same time, how can you support your own innovation systems? How do you defend privacy issues? Who, you know, if we talk about data, for instance, data ownership, who owns the data, right? Uh, is it because you know, <laughs> you've, you, 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 you've provided your data on Facebook? Does it belong to Facebook or does it belong to you? Certainly the EU now is, you know, has, has approached this question. <laughs> I'm sure we'll hear later about that. Okay. Uh, but it, it, a lo it, it's kind of interesting where now it seems that there's a much bigger debate in Canada that was not there before where we kind of took free trade for granted, right? Open borders, remove obstacles, and, and Canada's going to do well. And now there's quite a question as to, is that really the way to go? And I, I think these are the broader questions that are being discussed out of this panel. And it's interesting to see that Canada, you know, a G7 country, is also asking the same questions right now, even though we've kind of done the deals already, interestingly enough. So I'll stop here and we can continue the conversation later. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Really, really interesting because the same type of questions are those that are asking uh, developing economies and emerging economies, you know, so this adequate and balanced level of right. protection. No? So thank you very much. Uh, we are going to continue with uh, Vanessa, Vanessa Lowenstein. Uh, Vanessa, so we have these IP chapters. 
But IP is also addressed in other contexts, uh, bilateral investment treaties, for instance. Um, uh, what, what else can be done to promote technology transfer? So are the IP chapters enough? Are the, are the IP chapters useful? Uh, do you see other means to promote uh, technology transfer? Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, ICTSD, and particularly thank you, Javier. Uh, well, um, nowadays we all realize about the impact of uh, new free trade agreements, not only with regards to intellectual property standards, but also to investment standards. And the question here that I was asked to to answer was, well, what about the overlapping? Is it good, is it bad for innovation to promote technology transfer? Where does it let us? And as Patrick said, it's all a question of balance. When TRIPS was negotiated, there, there we used to say, or, or there is a supposed a balance between access and limitation, between promote innovation and dissemination of knowledge. There in the multilateral frames, framework, there's a balance between the writing of an exclusive rights and the dissemination and access to knowledge. So what happened then? Well, we have to be really careful about the overlapping, not only of future intellectual property clauses, but also the interaction between different disciplines. In this regard, uh, I'm concerned about the impact of uh, investment chapters on IP standards, particularly, for example, in the cases of uh, TRIPS flexibilities, for example, when you want a compulsory license, maybe it could be questioned through the investment chapter as being considered a, a direct or indirect expropriation. Also, with the cases of the dispute settlement mechanism, where in the IP chapters only states can sue states, but in the investment chapters, uh, enterprises have legal standing to to question states' uh, politics or protection. Uh, so we have to be really careful about this overlapping. And well, I, I really believe that we only have been working on the protection side, but from the investment point of view, uh, I was working on about thinking new ways to promote innovation and technology transfer and maybe like a performance requirement could be a really important and interesting tool to, to develop in order to promote technology transfer and innovation through the host country from an intellectual property perspective. This is like a local working clause from an IP point of view. And maybe this can be analyzed uh, furthermore, not only in the investment chapters, but also you can, like, it's like nowadays the international norm setting rules, they promote the delocalization of the production. You create the knowledge in one territory, you fix the knowledge with the tangible assets in another territory, and you use this asset with knowledge in a certain territory. Maybe we can also analyze a way in which you relocalize the knowledge with the fixing in the tangible good or service in one country, and this is a way uh, of promoting technology transfer and innovation, maybe uh, uh, in the end. Because these global chain values can help in one way, but sometimes this they create a debalance in the other way. You can also use, for example, performance requirements not only in investment chapters, but also in services or in, you can give preference in service chapters or you can give preference to uh, in, in the government procurement chapter, you can give preference to innovation or to technology transfer, so you promote or you prefer companies who technology transfer to your country or who create jobs or make innovation in your territory. So this is something that you can also work in the future. Maybe in some other chapters like sanitary or phytosanitary or trade barriers, uh, technical barriers to trade or also environment standards, you can condition the, those standards by saying that, okay, I'm going to reach them, but if you transfer technology in those areas or in those topics. So 
um, maybe like the 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 idea or or the or the the idea behind all this is to make local working classes that were forbidden maybe some people says yes some people says no but were forbidden in the IP chapters making work through other uh, chapters in the international negotiation and well the um, the alternative is like to to like the message is 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 to I, I don't know how to say that new IP clauses are are diminishing the flexibilities in the trips agreements and investment chapters are diminishing the flexibilities of trips agreement but these flexibilities can be done not only through intellectual property clauses in the intellectual property chapter, but by creating intellectual property technology clauses through other chapters of the free trade agreements. For example, environment, uh, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, in, in maybe investment measures, environmental measures. So the idea is to make uh, working clauses in those chapters and for example, local content, local product, local working, manufacturer related measures or knowledge sharing tools, adding these sort of clauses through the whole agreement, not only in the IP section. Well, that's the message I want to share. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Uh, I think that you raised a very uh, timely point. So innovation goes beyond the IP chapter. No? We find innovation related uh, provisions in uh, many other chapter services, investment, uh, even sanitary, sanitary measures. No? So thanks for that. Uh, another uh, central area of interest of all of us is, is relation of data. How data interacts and uh, relates with innovation. And uh, in free trade agreements, normally we focus attention in intellectual property chapters, but more and more they contain as well some references to data protection and ownership. Well, uh, Provir, uh, could you develop a little bit more on that, please? Sure. Thanks very much, Javier. And, and it's great to be here, and, and I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience. Um, so uh, uh, I'm going to, Javier and I talked about focusing a little bit on, um, on innovation, but how that impacts IP chapters. And uh, what I think is really important, I think what we really need to ensure um, from, from our perspective is that uh, free trade agreements keep up with technology, that negotiators constantly are assessing, evaluating, and educating themselves about how technological change is occurring and ensuring that the rules that are applied in this area are keeping pace with that. And I wanted to focus on copyright today because I think copyright is an area where we've seen you know, tremendous changes um, in the last 20 years. Um, um, you know, a previous speaker noted uh, that NAFTA was negotiated 20 years ago. Um, frankly, the NAFTA, they're in all the thousands of, of legal text pages. There's not one mention of the internet or similar things. And the internet itself was a, was a dial-up, you know, sort of, I remember, I'm sure many people in this audience hopefully <laughs> remember, at least I do, the sound of dialing up to the internet and the very slow speeds, maybe the picture would download very slowly. Clearly, we've seen giant technological advances in broadband access um, in, a, in a profusion and explosion of internet uh, different business models. And I think one of the most interesting areas is, is the rise of online platforms. And that's one thing we've really seen in the last 10 years. Uh, and that, you know, changes in that were occurring when many countries like the European Union and the United States were negotiating kind of a, a first wave of bilateral free trade agreements in the mid 2000s. So there were some very you know, sort of like basic provisions, but it wasn't fully fleshed out. And I think what we see now um, in most recently in the, the TPP um, uh, is uh, a recognition of how balanced copyright can be extraordinarily important. And again, what, what we mean by balanced copyright is clearly the intellectual property system copyright is really important to technology platforms. And um, you know, for Facebook, for example, content creators create some of the most engaging content on the platform. And it's really important uh, to continue to create incentives for that. Um, we have a lot of small uh, and medium enterprise uh, you know, musicians and others who use Facebook pages, which is uh, a free service that you can, uh, you can sort of put up um, and you can sort of 
you know, sort of stream songs, do Q's and A's with your fans. You can, uh, you know, you can have liner notes and explanations to some of your songs. So clearly you're finding, uh, you know, the broadening of creativity is creating a lot of opportunities for musicians and others that, you know, heretofore would have to rely on literally playing in a subway stop. And now, you know, Facebook and, and, and YouTube and others provide more opportunities for that. But that also means that, you know, that there, you need to have a balanced copyright law to ensure that there are incentives, but also for the development of online platforms. And again, this is large and small platforms. Um, online platforms exist in developed, developing countries um, in many different forms. You need to have a basis of rules. And I think uh, that's really important for a number of reasons. And I think there are two sets of rules in copyright that um, we're very interested in governments um, digging into deeper as they negotiate trade agreements. First is this concept of uh, intermediary liability protections. Um, we've seen this in some free trade agreements, uh, most recently in TPP. Um, and what we're seeing is governments are de developing different systems. You know, the US and EU had uh, the existing systems for almost 20 years now, but other governments have also developed systems. And in TPP, for example, uh, we see that you know, Canada has a system, uh, Japan has a system, um, you know, Malaysia, uh, New Zealand, um, et cetera. And so those are systems that the TPP try to craft a provision that ensure that there was, a, uh, there was a regime in place and that it was effective and that it balanced different interests that were there. And I think that's really important. I think that's one area that we think would benefit the entire online platform ecosystem. The second, and this goes uh, to sort of the technological point, is the issue of uh, exceptions and limitations to copyright. I think this is an area that TPP really created for the first time, a provision that um, obligated parties to uh, achieve a balance in their copyright systems um, through use of exceptions, limitations, other measures um, to promote things like criticism, commentary, important social goals. And again, for the, a platform like Facebook, that's really important. Um, of course, Facebook is used uh, by uh, you know, users to exchange uh, pictures of pets, um, you know, <laughs> talk to your parents, not always, uh, you know, but lots of different family relationships across borders. And, but Facebook is also incredibly uh, important for uh, political speech and to ensure that um, voices um, from users can get out there. And then again, it's very important that you have uh, balanced copyright. And for example, in the United States, you have fair use, which is a critical driver of innovation. Other countries, you have uh, a variety of different exceptions that can still accomplish the same objective. And I think that the second piece, that was really important, uh, I think, in TPP. So um, again, there's many other things um, that we could talk about. But I think clearly this is an important area, um, and we hope that governments continue to work on this area and develop uh, systems that uh, can fit in their um, level of development and their level of, of how they seek to achieve a strong marketplace. Thank you very much. For, uh, in a way, there are many, many new things, but they send us back to the foundational aspects, no? because in the very same treaty agreement, uh, it is made explicit this balance between the rights of the owners and the interest of the users. And uh, this is, was part of, of your presentation. So uh, we are going to continue with uh, Mariano, Mariano Genovesi. Uh, he is uh, the head legal counsel of the National Association of Pharmaceutical Producers. And a very important question is what national uh, industries uh, get out of these agreements? And how, uh, by extracting some benefits, these agreements contribute to national development if they contribute to national development. So please, Mariam, if you could have... Thank you, Xavi. Um, thank you, ITF, ICTSD. Uh, I remember uh, with Pedro Rofa, we worked for the Perua government 10 years ago with the implementation of the free trade agreement between Peru and USA, and then we worked together with the Inter-America Development Bank making a, a study about the different trade agreements, the, as Pedro said, the 1.0 as NAFTA, 2.0 Chile, third generation, Peru, Colombia, maybe fourth generation, TPP, ACTA, and uh, so on. Um, after TRIPS agreement, where one of the main objectives was the transfer of technology between developing countries and developing countries, the experience after 10 years of implementation of free trade agreement in Latin America, uh, I would say that there is a break of contract because uh, American 
Latin American countries implement all these provisions, TRIPS agreement and free trade agreements, but we do not receive any transfer of technology based on of the uh, high level of intellectual property, mainly patents and data protection. If you see what happened, for instance, in Colombia with the um, data exclusivity that is in force since 2001, 100% of the new chemical entities protected in Colombia uh, are imported from foreign countries. There is no transfer of technology. There is no new manufacturing facilities in Colombia. Uh, there is no new jobs created, industrial jobs created in Colombia. There are transfer of uh, foreign currency dollars to pay these, these imports. So it's the first question, well, what is the earning for Colombia in the IP chapter? What's the trade-off that you may which is, is fulfilled, is completed? I, I don't know. If you see what happened, for instance, in Argentina with the patents granted after 2000 when the TRIPS protection, TRIPS provisions in patent, product patent for pharmaceuticals uh, were enforced, you see that uh, all, all the medicines protected by patents in Argentina are imported, 90-70%. So, uh, um, is the way to improve uh, higher the standard for IP in free trade agreements, for instance, in Mercosur, European Union? I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I, I believe that there are other tools for promote transfer of technology. Uh, for instance, I remember very well a case in 2009 or 2010 in Argentina after the um, the, the pandemic of the influence, the, the flu. There's no vaccines on the world. The Argentina have problems to, to get the vaccines. And there was uh, an agreement between uh, Novartis and a local producer uh, with the support of the health minister that they, they, they used the, the power of the, the shop power for uh, assure that if there is a transfer of technology during six years, the Ministry of Health will buy the vaccines to the to the this consortium. And what's happened? In only one year, the manufacturing plant was built. And right now, there is not only they are manufacturing vaccines for many diseases. Uh, this same facility is used for produce biosimilars. So it's not the IP that triggered the innovation of the traffic of technology. It was the business opportunity. So uh, it's like in the real world uh, happen, maybe in the academia we believe, we, we think flexibilities, uh, exhaustion, l compulsory licensing. How many compulsory licenses was granted in Argentina? No one in 20 years, no one. How many uh, patents will declare, uh, were nullified? Only one after 16 years of, of uh, lo uh, lawsuit. So um, I, I think that we should, see what happened in the real world, which is the, the, the tool we need. And the negotiations with the Mercosur and between Mercosur and, and European, I think that's completely unbalanced, the chapter IP. If, for instance, if you see the section of enforcement, you see all the main institutions of the European directive, but uh, you, it's very hard to find only one um, flexibility or uh, a disposition that make a balance <coughs> uh, in favor of the users of the competitors. And all, all the chapters have the same problem. Uh, I asked maybe Pedro, no? Is, digamos, we received an uh, export of the norms of, and the standards for the European. Maybe we, we receive a, a kind of neocolonialism for the implementation of this these provisions, but what, what, at the end, what is to promote innovation, local innovation, to promote local jobs, or to guarantee exportation of manufacture from Europe? Uh, I, I think that the second one is the answer. Uh, we, we see what's the problem right now that European countries want to protect their agriculture and their policy for, for their inefficient producers of food in Europe. Uh, at the same time, they, they pretend that uh, we, we were very liberal in, in our standards. 
Um, I think that after 20 years, 24 years of trade agreement and negotiations, uh, we should uh, rethink if IP is really uh, a tool for trigger uh, the transfer of technology. Thank you very much, Mariano. I, I think that once again we have the, the word balance, no? uh, whether these agreements are balanced and if they are balanced, they are positive, and if they are not balanced, they are not positive. Uh, thanks for, for your views. We will have time to discuss and to, to debate on this, but I would like to continue with uh, Pranav Kumar. Uh, so India is uh, another big player. We have just listened Argentina, Mercosur, but wh what is the position of the Indian uh, industry with respect to free trade agreements and, and IP? Uh, are, these, uh, are the views of the industry different depending on the IP category at the stake or you have a common perception of the, of the contribution of these free trade agreements and IP to your national industry development? Thank you very much, Chair. Let me also express my gratitude to uh, ICTSC for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. I particular to Andrew, uh, so very kind of you. And the uh, issue is, uh, and question, let, I'll, I'll come back to the questions later, but uh, before that, let me just uh, react to some of the points which have emerged uh, out of this discussion. So two issues are very clear, IP is a tool for development and IP also, IP is also important for technology transfer because uh, if you want technology transfer, it comes through either investment flow, more FDI, FDI is a channel and vehicle for technology transfer and also with strong IP, you can access the technology market. So these two are very important and when we talk about investment, investment is also linked to trade these days because of the global value chain, the kind of the production network. You just cannot talk about trade and investment in two different baskets. So from that perspective, trade, investment and IPR are very much linked. Now coming to the development aspect, uh, when we talk about development and when we are recognizing the fact that uh, IP is a tool for development, we also have to understand and acknowledge that uh, the world is not equal, the, different, the countries are at different levels of development. So there is a asymmetry, there is a heterogeneity around. So we have to recognize the fact that uh, the level of IPR enforcement and IPR regime will grow as the country grows in the, uh, as climb in the ladder of development. So this is very important. The kind of IPR regime US and Europe could have that kind of IPR regime we cannot expect in many African countries, many Asian countries which are there those countries are in the different level of development, lower level of development track. Now coming to the Indian industry position and uh, in the context of uh, FTAs particularly, mm -hmm. India uh, has signed a uh, large number of FTAs with some of the key countries like uh, starting with ASEAN, Japan, Korea and we are also negotiating with EU India, EU European Union. Uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, so all countries are covered except USA and also in RCEP we are by default we are negotiating FTA with China also in spite of the, some reservation from Indian industry. And it's a well known fact that the government of India has taken a stand no TIFs plus. So far in all agreements we have maintained that. And uh, I have no hesitation in confessing that we as the industry also support that stance that at least in FTAs uh, there should not be any TIFs plus uh, provisions. <coughs> Because after the enactment of the uh, adoption of the TRIPS in the WTO, uh, majority of the country, including India, we had to adopt a new uh, law. So in, if you look at the Indian uh, IPR law, so it's a brand new law. So just five or ten years back, we had adopted a brand new law. And then again, if you go for FTA plus, then again, we'll have to go for complete overall and uh, try to make <laughs> several amendments in your new laws. Uh, so this is uh, very important, but what we are supporting and if you look at, again we have to understand and, uh, and the point which is very important here is this IPR as a tool for investment flow and invest investment flow and investment flow will also result in technology transfer and that fact is getting recognized increasingly in India because of, of our emphasis on manufacturing revival. Many of you must have heard about the make in India. Uh, the campaign which Prime Minister himself is uh, spearheading that. And under that initiative, we are trying to invite and attract more investment to manufacturing sectors. So in making India a scheme of things, it's not only about open investment regime, but we are trying to create an ecosystem. 
we are trying to address all possible issues which will help attract more investment and that's why you have seen this year ease of doing business we have just jumped 30 uh, 30 rank uh, from 130 to 100 so and ipr is also a part of this so we have adopted a national ipr mission a national ipr strategy where we are trying to address whole lot of issues where which will help in extending our domestic ipr region which will also help in attracting investment from uh, at least some of the big countries like us us industry is very particular about investment uh, Germany, which is a strong manufacturing uh, 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 country in Europe. So, so that initiative, Government of India is very much uh, 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 taking and recognizing the fact that if as long as your IPR regime is uh, not so strong, that you will always struggle to get technology intensive investment. Second is that uh, on WIPO front, World Intellectual Property Organization also, we are taking a lot of initiative. Because earlier also we were quite tough in negotiating with WIPO, but over the last five, uh, seven years, we have covered a lot of ground and we have cooperated, like we have acceded to the Patent Cooperation Treaty, we have acceded to the Madrid Protocol. So a lot of those outside the trade region, outside the WTA, outside the FTA, we are taking a lot of initiatives to cooperate and to, uh, uh, to improve our IPR regime. Now, uh, finally, uh, in FTAs particularly, uh, if you look at the India's uh, uh, position, there are two FTAs where, of course, this has become uh, contentious. Uh, uh, two agreements, I would say. One, of course, EU-India FTA, but, we, and, but this was settled through the mutual agreement that we will not be able to, from EU side, that we will not be able to raise our expectation of on, IP, on IP and chips part from India. But other agreement, which is very uh, almost tall, I would say, that India-EU bilateral, India-US bilateral no, investment treaty, yeah. Where the U.S. Uh, approach is very uh, uh, strict that uh, we want this, this and this. And India, India is also very strong in terms of its stance on uh, uh, IPR because of the several uh, factors which are political, domestic, pressure from international community also because India is a world supplier of generic uh, drugs and all. So it's not only domestic pressure and political pressure but pressure from the other rights group internationally also in India not to dilute your stance on IPR. So it is very difficult in that situation for government of India to go ahead and take any drastic measures, particularly in the trade uh, uh, arena. But at the same time, as I mentioned that uh, India does recognize the importance of IPR for your development, for attracting investment. That's why outside the trade regime, India is going ahead, trying to cooperate, trying to improve. And that is, what very, very, that is also very important for all other countries. For instance, I would give you one example here in case of standards particularly, all the SPS and TBT. Because these days we have nego negotiating trade agreements. Almost tariffs are going down in most of the countries. You get preference on tariffs. Most of the LDCs, they have a geography market access. But you don't get preference on the standards. So standards will have, will have to comply. A standard is a major barrier these days. So all countries are trying to unilaterally comply with their standards, are trying to improve their standard regime. So similarly, in IPR also, because all countries are vying for investment and, and technology in, intensive investment, so they have to improve their investment uh, IPR regime. Then only you can attract more technology intensive investment. So domestic initiatives is very important to improve your IPR regime. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pranav. Uh, well, again, no, the, 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 the possibility to, to Ambitious, a fully fledged uh, national innovation policy. Uh, this is one of the, the, the comments that we can, or one of the conclusions that we can draw from uh, Pranav's uh, comments. And I think that Vanessa was very much in the same line. No? The, the, the possibility to take a broader perspective towards innovation and, and, and the protection of IP, but as well other areas of uh, well, a legal interest to promote innovation. So now what we will try to do is uh, shortly, probably in a couple or three minutes, try to single out one aspect that uh, you can uh, think about in the context of the digital economy. What you have here uh, are these Amazon Kiva <laughs> robots. Uh, Amazon <coughs> owns more than 30,000 uh, of these robots and they coexist with about 200,000 uh, employees. 
So economy and innovation is changing. Uh, we tend to uh, focus on patterns when we uh, discuss uh, innovation, but there are many other areas that uh, promote and influence innovation. And one of them indeed is data. Uh, there is this overlap between regulatory exclusivities and intellectual property. Uh, all of them, all these different uh, types of uh, protection and measures, uh, in principle, are designed or are meant to promote innovation. So if you had to single out one issue, one specific area that free trade agreements could address, and maybe now they are not doing enough, uh, which will be this specific area and, and why? So Pedro, I don't know if you We'll start with some well, insights on this. Well, uh, thank you, Xavier. Uh, well, first, uh, a disclaimer, which is I'm an EU official, and on the part of IPK, I have been part of uh, Mercosur ongoing negotiations as an observer, uh, and I have been part of IP dialogues. I've already established uh, negotiations as uh, the ones with the Andean region. Um, my impression is it really depends on the, the starting point. If you believe IP indeed is a tool to foster innovation economy, uh, my perception is that the FTAs, currently the way they are negotiated and drafted, have this stepping point. Uh, I understand uh, my fellow panelist uh, colleague has perhaps a, a different opinion or at least some skepticism. I can certainly understand that there are many ways to find uh, an understanding and agreement when it comes to free trade agreements. Seeing technically, uh, and this is as far as I can go without overstepping my mandate of purely technical uh, aid to the negotiations, seeing how uh, the negotiations are conducted technically, uh, chapter after chapter, uh, I see IP is covered. IP is covered in this perspective and I also see it in a balanced way. Uh, certainly there is room for improvement, as always, and certainly uh, I couldn't agree more with what was also said before, that the FTAs have to chase the, step, the, the current stance of technology. So in that sense, absolutely, an FTA that is negotiated uh, five years ago uh, will have shortcomings when it comes to technology. But again, this is why IP dialogues exist and I, I've, I, two weeks ago, I was, I was in the IP dialogue of the EU and the Andean region with Colombia, Peru, and Ecuador. And suddenly, the, the, the new upcoming uh, issues, not only legislation, but also in reality, technology, are there. So I have a very conservative perspective there, as I had to have. Uh, but I understand, of course, there is room for improvement. Thank you. Pedro. So, Patrick? Yeah. Um, I, I'll, I'll take up the issue of, of data, uh, which I think is, is, is certainly, you know, a lot of people who work on artificial intelligence and say, you know, data is the new gold, it's the future, uh, you know, it's kind of everyone has to have it if we're going to have this, this, these new innovations taking place. And, and of course, in terms of, of, of free trade, right, it means that data should be allowed to flow uh, across borders. Uh, it, it's kind of interesting, again, from a, a Canadian perspective that uh, in CETA, there is no mention of data governance, data flows. That, you know, the e-commerce chapter is actually quite weak. In, 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 in surprisingly, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership goes further. It actually has provisions on 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 um, the uh, the free flow of, of data across borders. However, uh, the there are, you know when it when it comes to actually the kind of binding provisions, there is the so-called exceptions, right, to pursue legitimate public policy objective. And and, I, and, and of course, there the question is well. What is, is privacy, right? This is a public policy objective. Security matters, public safety, these kinds of things. Uh, and, and so far, the, the, the big question, and it goes back, I guess, to the overall theme of this battle, which is the balance issue. Uh, we don't really know what the exceptions are, what is legitimate, right? And, 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 and ultimately, you know, we've put that language into at least one, one major trade agreement, uh, but then we're going to have to leave it to the courts to decide what is acceptable, what is not. Uh, and then, you know, it, it, to what extent is it a problem where these issues are addressed within uh, regional trade agreements or plurilateral, plur plurilateral trade agreements, or should they be discussed much more broadly, 
right? Uh, because yes, if we want to ensure uh, the, 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 the cross-border flow of data, but at the same time, we want to make sure that you know, countries are able to protect their citizens, to protect their, their, you know, their, their borders in a way, to protect their individuals, their privacies. Uh, if there are different rules being made in different countries, in different areas, uh, are uh, RTAs or FTAs really going to be able to address those issues? And what if, you know, what I is there going to be common agreement on, you know, what is a legitimate public policy objective? Is it going to be different in different agreements? So ideally, this should be discussed globally, but certainly right now, it, it doesn't seem, you know, WTO certainly has, has not been able to make any progress so far. Uh, and, 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 you know, are we just going to have the danger, as, as I guess I see it, is it going to be fragmentation down the line, right? Are we going to have a, a, a digital trade world that is fragmented between major regions, whether it's China, the EU, the US, and countries trying to gravitate around that? And then what is that going to do for innovation, for access to data? Uh, and, and, and is it going to be only the larger firms that will have the ability to take advantage of that world? Because, of course, there's going to be much higher transaction costs. So if you're a small, medium-sized business, how are you going to get the data? How are you going to get access? Are you, are you going to be able to operate in, in different areas? So I guess these are major uh, questions to which we don't really have the answer. Ideally, you, you'd want to have a framework that creates this balance at, at the global level. Whether we can reach that, I guess that's the, the, the big question. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yes. Well, I was wondering, uh, I was listening, about the scope and the level of the regulation, because I don't know if countries like mine or many other countries, we have discussed those issues uh, enough at national level because I'm, I believe that first you have to have a clear position where you are or where you, go, where you want to go at national level, then maybe regional, and then maybe you can put in a free trade agreement, but just the opposite building uh, legislation on, on regular or norms in the free trade agreements or at multilateral level and then going down. I don't know if if it suits like national policy and, and rules. So maybe I, I believe that they have to be built national, regional and then at multilateral or be regional level. Maybe international level some principles or values but the norm setting, I, I believe that the process is from down to top. Thank you. So I, I thought I might sort of expand on one of my initial arguments, um, which was about the value of kind of a balanced copyright system for technological innovation. And if you looked at uh, Javier's slide, you saw the Kiva um, sort of robotic transport uh, device. Uh, that relies a lot on artificial intelligence techniques, machine learning techniques, um, reviewing you know, different uh, pictures and, and data that's available on the internet. Um, and that is something that I think is an important area of innovation that countries around the world are dealing with at universities, um, you know, research institutes. Uh, and one of the benefits of language that perhaps in the TPP or you, know, you, could, you could also imagine um, more sort of stronger language uh, was that you were focused on ensuring that you have exceptions to enable technological innovation. I think that's where um, it's an interesting feature because traditionally copyright has just been seen as kind of a um, sort of right holder versus user balance, but that's I think not the way it is anymore that you have a lot of participants in the ecosystem that all have legitimate uh, interests and then the idea is how to find a way forward. Um, for example, on artificial intelligence, if you think about computer vision, computer vision is uh, where um, you know, the computer is actually seeing and identifying what an image is. Um, and that could be helpful for you know, people with disabilities, that could be helpful for obviously autonomous cars, things like that, so that you're not sort of, um, that you have uh, uh, you know, ability to do that. The problem I think we see is that if you don't have large enough opportunities, and that's where copyright can interface in different ways. Um, you can have biased um, artificial intelligence that doesn't really capture the variety of different places in image, and I think that's important, especially from the developing country perspective. I mean, it's one thing to sort of say, whatever US and Europe, um, there are images available there online, but it's another thing to sort of have this kind of be, you know, 
usable for, for folks around the world. So I think that's just some of the, the interesting pieces that I think as trade negotiators develop these standards in PTAs uh, to look at some of these issues. And again, that sort of key theme of ensuring that it stays current with technological innovation. Thank you. Mariano? Yes, Javi, um, we are talking about big data, but in fact we have problems with the small data. Small data, for instance, the international no proprietary name of uh, patent. <coughs> uh, we, we made uh, a research in Argentina for you now about, there is about 2,000 pharmaceutical patents granted. And there is only two or three percent that the international no proprietary name is in the specification. Uh, we made a research with a team from the biochemist and chemist uh, uh, school of the University of Buenos Aires, people with huge experience in research, people who have a PhD from European and US universities. They work with the main database, Thompson Innovators. It's like in the first world. And they only can Ident uh, identify 200 patents with the, no, with the international no proprietary name. The other patents, we don't know what is protected. It's impossible to know. These people, after five months of work, were not able to identify the EIRN. So I think one principle very important to negotiate the three agreement is, is the establish a mandatory clause for identify uh, no pro uh, international no proprietary name in patent application. There is also a problem when you see specifications of the patent and you try to, to scale uh, to, from the lab to the industrial uh, stage uh, a, a process to get the pharmaceutical because most, most, most of the patent specifications describe a lab a lab process, and when you make the scale, it's impossible to repeat. So there's no, uh, uh, the, the best method to, to, to get the product is not enabled. So I think that these small things, maybe you, you can trigger at the, at the FDA, you know? Uh, I know that Mercosur proposed these, these issues, and I know that uh, the European Union reject to include this provision. So I, I'm very surprised about that, no? because we're talking about transparency, access to, to knowledge, and all these things uh, is not available for, for, for researchers, for, for, for all the competitors, for the public sector. No? I, I think that is, these are small things that you could improve in only with establish some mandatory rules in the way that you present uh, uh, the patents, uh, when you file the patent. Thank you, Mariano. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I tend to agree that uh, this is the age of uh, data, and because of the digital revolution, it has broken all the physical barriers and data are moving freely. So how we can uh, take uh, recognition of that fact and include in trade agreement? Uh, in fact, uh, and, but here also we have to recognize that there is a big digital divide also between large companies, small companies, between large nations and smaller nations. And that digital divide also has to be big. Otherwise, you will tend to create an undue uh, un, uh, advantage to some companies, some nations. So when we talk about the development per perspective should be integrated, that is very important, how we, are, we bridge that digital divide. Because if, it, if we don't do that, then of course, the big company, like if, what is, what we are facing in e-commerce also. We are, you have two big giants, the three big giants, they have big advantage in terms of their burning capital all over the world to drive out competition. So that we have to understand, but at the same time it is, uh, uh, it is understandable that uh, data has become important, data are moving freely, it is a threat to privacy and all. So we need some kind of regulatory uh, framework to discipline that, to check that and respect the and protect the privacy of individuals and at the same time as I mentioned that uh, uh, how to uh, uh, bridge the digital divide, otherwise we will not be able to uh, achieve the, what, uh, the developmental objective through it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we can uh, open the, the floor to, to discussion and uh, to questions. Uh, there are, eventually. 
please. Well, thank you, Javier. This has been a, a very good discussion. Uh, so, Prohit, uh, I believe you mentioned that it is important for trade agreements to keep up with technology. Um, but, but the reality is that it is, trade norms are very hard to make and extremely hard to modify. We, we have an example in the trade agreement, in the, in the TRIPS agreement, in which uh, the first amendment, uh, in the, the only amendment so far was uh, approve or, or agree in 2001, it was entered into force in 2017 this year. Yeah, uh, yeah but the, the paragraph six was adopted in, in, in Doha, right? So, but in, in, in any case, many years after it was, it was amended, it, it was amended on a version that was actually for many restrictive in, in comparison to what was actually agreed. So, an example of how difficult it is to change trade norms we have in, in, in the trade agreements with regards to access to medicine. Aren't you concerned that adopting norms for the internet, for example, or for artificial intelligence that will probably be there for many, many decades, uh, I will, not, will not keep up actually with changes with technology, right? And if I may, Xavier, another question to Mariano, because you, you gave us a very good insight of what is happening in the EU Mercosur negotiations and a perspective from the generic industry, which I, I think uh, I've been in Argentina for many years and one of, in a study in intellectual property, one of the merits that the generic industry in Argentina has in, compar in comparison to all the countries in the region is it's very organized and understand intellectual property very well. Um, and, and you clearly re reflected that in your intervention. And so, so what we're seeing today, reports from the EU Mercosur negotiation, is that the key issue is meat, the access market for meat. That, that is what is probably going to delay or whatever is going to happen with the, the, the negotiation, the key, the key aspect is market access for meat. And so, are you concerned that if European negotiators are prepared next year to grant market access to meat, Mercosur negotiations will be pressured to give concessions on intellectual property? And the reason, the additional reason why I ask this question is because it is a good example of why is it dangerous or complex to negotiate some of these issues in trade agreements, something that has to do with access to pharmaceuticals and, and prices of medicine depends on market access for meat. So it is an example of why is it complicated to bring topics like the internet to forums like trade or trade-related forums. I think that is for you, Pauline. Sure, I, you know, and I think that the gentleman, I'm sure, I'm, I'm not certain what are you with an affiliation or? Researcher of Okay, so I think that it's, and, and, and that brings up a very good question, which is how do you craft trade agreements? And, uh, you know, that has been something that you go back to the, the beginning of the, you know, sort of the modern trading system, the GATT. The idea was how do you create disciplines with exceptions um, to facilitate cross-border trade? Uh, that's sort of always been the dynamic. When you get to intellectual property, you do have some baseline norms. You have the WIPO uh, treaties, for example, the Berne Convention that was written into TRIPS. You have, uh, you know, other variety of other um, IP-related treaties. But ultimately, the idea is countries can sit down, and they don't. I mean, that's the level of prescriptiveness. And I think that's one thing we, you know, that that we saw in TPP that you saw a departure from previous trade agreements and trying to find language that could work for different systems and facilitate the kind of good outcomes that we want. So I wouldn't sort of suggest um, that if someone literally write the entire code of their entire law into, um, for example, on, 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 on artificial intelligence uh, into a trade agreement, that may not uh, you know, that may not be warranted, but you can find out broader principles. How is artificial intelligence promoted now by existing copyright law, like fair use and others? And you can try to find areas where you can, you can have an outcome, but that still allows flexibility for countries to have different ways to meet the objective. Yeah, Mariano. Yeah, thank you, Luis. Um, 
Well, I, I don't believe that meat is the only problem with the negotiations between Mercosur and European Union. IP is other issue, big issue. Um, the, 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 I think the problem is that all, all for the four governments of Mercosur are back in the position of the generic industry that in fact is a national policy for our countries because in terms of development of jobs, quality jobs, research, access to medicines, there's a, a value I itself, there are a very important value and I, I don't believe uh, that the uh, Mercosur governments uh, in the trade-off between carne and or ethanol uh, we grant uh, IP. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Uh, there are a statement for high officers, ministers, secretaries, that they understand the importance of the sector, the importance of, of an industrial generic uh, manufacturer for, as a tool for not only for health purposes, but uh, as a, a tool for developing the industry and technology in Argentina, Brazil, Mercosur. Uh, for instance, the last, I, I have a, a, an example. Uh, all, all, I think all you know the, the problem with the soft of wheel, the cost, the very the high cost to access. Uh, in, in Argentina, it's around $7,000. And a generic manufacturer in Argentina offered this, uh, this medicine in, for the health minister in $420. In absence of this sector, maybe the health minister should pay 7,000 or more because there is no competition. So I think the, all, all the four countries government knows the problem, knows that it's a very important tool for foster competition, innovation, and protect public health. Thank you very much, Mariano. Do you have uh, more questions from the audience? Okay, if this is not the case, uh, I, I wonder whether uh, the speakers could briefly uh, expand on their views on the current situation. Because on the one hand, we see that initiatives at the multilateral level, as far as intellectual property is concerned, are, having, are going through very difficult times. So anything, nothing is happening at the WTO in the context of IP. Uh, at the same time, all of the panelists share uh, this perspective that technological advances make it uh, necessary to adjust intellectual property, to improve intellectual property, uh, policy, protection, law. Uh, but at the same time, it seems that uh, bilateralism, plurilateralism are also having uh, difficult times. Uh, so then the answer uh, is, what do we do? Should we do nothing, stay like we are now? Uh, it seems that uh, this is uh, not commensurate with the challenges that we are facing. So, in between this multilateralism, plurilateralism, bilateralism, is there a space, for instance, imagine a sort of uh, model treaty, a bilateral model treaty that could be proposed and agreed uh, to be adjusted at the local level? So what, what are your views on, on, on this uh, present situation and the future of uh, negotiations having to do with intellectual property? So <laughs> Should we go in order or? <laughs> Not necessarily, <laughs> if you are volunteering. Uh, all right, you, uh, I'll go first. Uh, I, I guess you've asked, the, in a way, the, the most important question and probably the impossible question to answer at this point. Uh, I guess if we had the answer, then that'd be great. Um, I, I think, I think in, in part, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know if I have the answer. Certainly trying to get you know, everyone at the WTO to agree, as we've seen, is proving difficult, right? Given the way the WTO works, one of its greatest feature, but at the same time, in a way, going back to this idea of, of keeping up with technological changes, it makes it very difficult, right? If you're, everyone has to kind of keep up at the same time and you have to find the common language in the agreements, um, it, it, as we're seeing, it, it's, it's proving very difficult. So then is the option to say, okay, well, you do it within kind of bilateral or regional free trade agreements, and then the issue, I mean, it goes back to a little bit 
to, to what the gentleman raised is that, well, you, know, so you, you will have to some extent asymmetry uh, between the negotiating partners uh, where, you know, one partner say, okay, you want access to my market in this particular sector, well, this is what we want. And is that really the way you're going to have, in a way, the kind of common solutions or common governance framework? So ultimately, this is what we're talking about, right? We're talking about a, a governance framework if we're talking about, you know, a balanced copyright approach. Or if we're talking about, again, finan finding the balance between, you know, the free flow of data, the access to data that has been mentioned, while at the same time ensuring that countries feel that they're still able to somehow you know, secure their population and their border and, and you know, people's privacy, uh, individual privacies. Uh, and, 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 and they may not necessarily want to be, you know, so kind of impose a model. Uh, and so, it, you know, th th I guess that's really the issue where, you know, do we hope that by having free trade agreements, you know, it's going to be, you know, some model is going to arise and that will create the future? You know, some people have argued that, well, if we're not going to have a multilateral agreement, might as well have, you know, regional bilateral models that eventually can kind of group together. Or are we going to have a new spaghetti bowl on, on, on these issues, right? Um, or is, 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 should we try to pursue a more, you know, midway solution, which is to say, well, those countries that want to go forward, uh, you know, and maybe in a more plurilateral sense, but not necessarily in the sense of having an all-encompassing free trade agreement, right? But maybe in particular sectors, you know, we've done it in government procurement, for instance. So should that be the model to say, okay, well, when it comes to data governance, for instance, or digital trade, you know, which deals with e-commerce, but in, in a broader way, well, then should we seek some kind of governance uh, agreement model that would try to find in a way that right balance and if some countries are willing to go forward but at the same time you know doesn't prevent others from joining in but just focusing on that particular issue it, it, it maybe that's the way to go as opposed to say well let's do it as part of free trade agreements which then creates some of these issues that are more difficult and as we know free trade agreements once they're set well they're harder to change right uh, i mean yes now we're trying to put language that makes them into more living agreements or, you know, every five years, not sunset clauses, but actually renegotiation clauses where you revisit issues. But again, that, you know, means new negotiations that will take years. So, you know, between one agreement and the next version, you might have 10, 15 years. And by that time, of course, the world has changed tremendously, has already been mentioned. So should we just have these specific kind of governance, ag governance agreements, which might deal with not just the WTO, but other uh, international organizations or groups. Maybe that's the way to go and, and, and have you know, countries that are willing to address these issues move forward, but not just also re exclusively you know, the big countries or the big regions, but you know, smaller countries. Maybe that's, that's the way. Thank you, Patrick. And just a quick point. I think uh, we are passing through a page of, page of disruption. We are facing disruption at the multilateral level, so I'm not very optimistic uh, where we would be able to achieve something on this one, particularly when countries are struggling to agree on one particular issue. So, so but most unfortunately, uh, on the bilateral regional front also, particularly we have seen the Brexit happen in European Union, the President Trump when came, they withdrew from the TPP. So there are disruption at the bilateral regional level also. So it's a very, very vulnerable situation at that time. We are passing through a, a, a turbulent time as far as trade uh, regime and trade agreements are concerned. So in that situation, I am personally not very optimistic whether we would be able to achieve what we want till the time and the, uh, the very stable situation uh, we uh, is arrived. Thank you. Yes. Yes, yes, that maybe the single of the principle of single undertaking that at the beginning help in order to make cross uh, concessions between disciplines, it was a good idea, but nowadays maybe this principle is also blocking the the progress of the international or regional negotiations. 
So, I mean, that for Mercosur countries is also an opportunity to upgrade our regional uh, regulations on specific subjects, but maybe we can also think about dividing disciplines because it's all mixed in only one treaty and maybe rules and market access, rules, goals as sanitary and phytosanitary, intellectual property, environmental, or maybe you, maybe mixing all the disciplines in only one treaty is becoming a, a difficult in order to reach a consensus. So maybe it's just the opposite. At the beginning, uh, IP was outside the, 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 the system. Maybe we have to divide disciplines and see how it goes. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think that uh, we have to wrap up uh, this session. Uh, as you have uh, seen, uh, IP continues to be uh, a central uh, area of concern. Uh, everyone recognizes the, the centrality and the importance of uh, this area. At the same time, it's also very clear that depending on the countries and depending on where right holders are found, uh, positions uh, of countries change. Um, however, uh, th there are some uh, common areas and some common concepts that all panelists have uh, emphasized. And probably the first one is that of balance. As, as Patrick said, the overall uh, theme of this, uh, of this uh, panel is uh, balance. And to, to achieve uh, this balance, uh, I think that something that, that Pedro underlined could uh, be useful is uh, the, the relevance of having uh, the empiric information, the actual information on uh, the contribution of intellectual property to uh, national development, uh, national industries, uh, the, the benefits for consumers. No? Uh, where is uh, consumer, uh, where are consumers on in all these uh, type of debates? Uh, probably data, and uh, uh, it's, it's good that we had uh, Provir with us, uh, probably data protection has been the area that has captured the interest of the broad uh, spectrum of consumers to these uh, discussions. IP was there, but uh, everyone is concerned about data because everyone uses LinkedIn, Facebook, and, and the like. So uh, this attractiveness of uh, data maybe engages broader audiences to <coughs> find uh, new uh, positions, some of them have uh, been uh, proposed by panelists. I would like to emphasize or, or to point out the need for this comprehensive uh, policy of uh, on innovation, uh, going beyond IP. IP must be there, but we have to go beyond IP. And also understanding that uh, national uh, interests are central stage. So when countries negotiate these agreements, they think uh, about their uh, future in terms of economic uh, development, but also in terms of employment, in terms of the provision of vital products, for instance, medicines, and all this is in the table of uh, these free trade uh, negotiations. So uh, I think that a couple of uh, last remarks that were made are really interesting. So uh, is this not the time to start negotiating IP or a specific subject within IP or data, for instance, separately, those that are more mature, those that were, for instance, consensus can be found enforcement, for instance, mm -hmm. if we had agreed some standards, is not reasonable to go beyond and agree in the enforcement related uh, aspects of IP. So with these reflections, what I would like to do is to thank all the speakers uh, for your uh, insightful uh, comments and interventions, for keeping with the time, and, and for having accepted this invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.